in the magic of the witch's world, a powerful force that decides the fate of the continent, a dangerous power, uncontrollable and alien, its conquest can lead entire kingdoms to prosperity and glory. But when it falls into the hands of madmen, cruel conquerors whose ambitions outweigh any sacrifice, magic can destroy entire settlements, kill living beings by thousands, become a source of endless suffering. When humans first set foot on the land of the continent, the flesh of some of them was literally stabbed by this powerful unknown force. Humans had to master it. They simply had no choice. The first immigrants, colonizers, they found themselves in an alien, dangerous world filled with monsters where they had to use all means to survive. Magic became their greatest hope. The first to master this power was Jan Becker, who made water flow directly from a stone, demonstrating a miracle to the immigrants and giving them hope. It was a natural talent, and along with Becker, there were a few other lucky humans in that initial generation who, through their own will, were also able to master the art of magic on their own. But there were many who did not manage to acquire the talent of magic so easily. Most often, this power was possessed by children, who were called the sources. However, children lacked patience and experience, lacked the knowledge to understand what to do with this blessing, and this blessing became a curse. Without controlling the power, children could unconsciously do terrible things, cause death and terrify even their closest. Something had to be done about it, and the rapidly growing population of humans needed new sorcerers, so children had to be taught. So very soon the first generations of humans turned for help to the elven people, who had kept away from these new strange creatures. Humans were the first to come to the elves to ask, to ask for help, and the elves answered, hospitably opened their doors to them. In the meantime, get yourself some snacks, because we're continuing the story of the witch's universe. The first human states have already emerged, and it's time for human civilization to deal with new challenges. Magic, elves, war. Will the humans withstand all the trials and tribulations, and will they not drown in their own ambitions and cruelty? Before diving into this video, we'd like to extend our thanks to our patrons, the true sorcerers behind our motivation to conjure up more witch wonders on this channel. Join their mystical brotherhood and brace yourself for a journey, expecting even more quality content in return. But for now, the old witcher is ready to tell you guys the story of today's video. Novigradian Union Well, several decades have passed since humans landed on the continent. The first states already exist, young religions and laws have emerged, and the first roads and bridges have been built. On the western shore of the continent, the civilization of humans flourished. Sorcerers were one of the main architects of this civilization, as they protected human settlements from monsters, helped with crops and diseases. However, there were few magic users. They were truly outstanding individuals, a few out of hundreds or thousands who could master magical power on their own and without any training, simply because of their natural talent, they knew how to use it. It's difficult to even call this generation a generation, because there are only a few names. Of course, the first magician, Jan Becker, and along with him are Geoffrey Monk, Jean Battista, Ivo Richet, and Raphael the White. There may have been other names, but history has not preserved them. All these magicians considered the development of human civilization to be their main mission, and the common humans saw them as real saviors. So among the first peasants and townsfolk, the sorcerers enjoyed unconditional authority, and now this situation has caused concern. The first rulers and leaders of human states were particularly concerned. They thought, quite logically, that magicians could easily gain absolute power and become close to living deities with the power and loyalty they possessed. Sorcerers had to be controlled and regulated. This was the first global challenge of the human civilization. The first global challenge that humanity met quite well. Things became especially dangerous when hybrid types of magic began to emerge, such as druidry or the magic of priests of various gods. Some humans, although not as good as sorcerers, could feel magic and through various methods could still partially use it. This problem grew and could become uncontrollable. Therefore, in the period from 764 to 830, the first document designed to regulate the influence of magic on states was signed. We do not have the exact date, but it is not so important. What matters is the essence of the document, a historical document, a document that received the name of Novigradian Union. It is clear that this document was signed in the city of Novigrad. As we said in the previous video, Novigrad was one of the first human settlements founded on elven ruins, but the names of the kings who signed this document have not been preserved. 
taking the time period into account, we can assume that Desmat and Sembak were among those rulers. What we do know are the names of the magicians that signed that document. It is probably easier for long-lived magicians to preserve historical data. So the Novigradian Union was signed, of course, by Jan Becker, the first magician without whom this document would not have been possible, as well as Jean Battista and Geoffrey Monk. It is not known whether there were representatives from Druids and priests of different religions, but their interests were affected by this union for sure. So, the essence of the union was that the rulers of the human kingdoms enter into an alliance with sorcerers, priests and druids, promising these communities autonomy and non-interference in their affairs. In return, all those who possess magic pledge to stay out of the political life of the continent, to stay away from political offices and not to fight each other. Humans were very cautious and afraid of the magic war because they understood that such a war or such a powerful force as a weapon could simply lead to the end of civilization or even the end of the world. The treaty suited everyone and the Novigradian Union became the cornerstone of the entire future world order, although it irritated many ambitious magicians, such as Vilgefortz, who considered the Union a humiliating agreement. No one dared to transgress the basic principles of this Union. Sorcerers who wanted power had to operate from the shadows. Just think of Philippa Eilhart and kings were afraid to openly fight against the sorcerers, although they tried to find points of influence on any organizations of magic users. As a result, the Novigradian Union established the status quo, thanks to which human civilization gradually developed over many hundreds of years. The Origin and Path of Geoffrey Monk The Novigradian Union itself greatly simplified the life of sorcerers in terms of any of their actions other than political ones. Previously, their activities were something that could be interpreted as actions outside the law. Now everything was official and with an indulgence from the kings. Therefore, the sorcerers began to solve their most pressing issues. The first of these issues was the sources. This was the name of the children endowed with a powerful magical gift. Children who often could not control their power and caused harm to even their closest because of it. To prevent magic from being a problem, to prevent people from perceiving it as evil, and starting witch hunts, it needed control, control and training. Gifted children had to be found and taught to control the powers. In this way, the brotherhood of sorcerers would be replenished with new blood, and tension in the society and dislike of magic would grow much more slowly. The same first magicians, Jan Becker, Geoffrey Monk, Jan Battista, they realized the importance of this challenge, but they could not teach children themselves because they did not understand the laws of magic but were guided only by their talent and feelings. No one taught them either, they learned on their own. They discovered some laws and dependencies on their own as well. So they had to turn to those who knew, to those that studied magic for centuries, to the powerful elves of the continent. Geoffrey Monk was the only sorcerer who had contact with the elves. This is because the elves kept away from humans, having isolated themselves, and did not establish any contacts with them but did not fight with them either. The elves of Anshade were arrogant and they considered humans to be an underdeveloped race of idiotic savages who would either die or kill themselves over time. Only a few humans were so fortunate as to be admitted to the majestic elven cities and see the greatness of elven civilization. Among them was Geoffrey Monk. The elves most definitely respected them because of how well he mastered magic. What can we say it was Geoffrey Monk who was the first person to tame a real air genie. Yep, a real jinn. That is why Monk had a perfect command of the element of air, being able to create real portals. Of course, those were not portals between worlds, but only between points of space on the continent. But even this was incredible. Hundreds of years later, many of those portals have survived, and many of them lead to completely random amazing corners of the continent. Monk's teleportation spell is still used hundreds of years after his death. All the hurricanes, tornadoes and whirlwinds that occurred on the continent were attributed by ordinary humans to Geoffrey Monk, who said that he was just in a bad mood. In short, he was a very powerful sorcerer and quite respected even among the ancient, so reputable that he was not refused when he asked that elves teach human children gifted with magical gifts. And the elves agreed. Monk visited Loch Muine and asked Hamlet, one of the largest elven cities at the time, and his request was accepted. Maybe the elves hoped that humans would not forget the elven kindness. 
Maybe the elves were interested in how humans perceive magic. We do not know the motives of any shade for sure. We can only say one thing. The elves will soon regret their decision. However, there is still some time left until then. The Brotherhood of Sorcerers The First Generation And what of the other sorcerers? Well, while Monk was making his way to Loch Muine and Est Hamlet, John Batista and Jan Becker were searching for the sources. Children gifted with magic who were hiding among ordinary children and could actually burn everything within a diameter of 10 kilometers with enough skill. They looked for strange situation. They looked for strange situations, listened to gossip about wonders and miracles, and paid attention to myths or legends. During the time Monk was negotiating with the elves, the two were looking for magically gifted children and tried to take them away in various ways. The easiest situation was with homeless people, orphans, and children in simple families, who were given to good magicians for a couple of coppers. It was not so easy to take children from more noble families, but after conversations and explanations, some were also taken away. So when Monk returned, there were already quite a few children who were sent to study in elven cities to take lessons from the elven sages. Thus, the first generation of the continent sorcerers was formed in this way, where Fart and Monk's generation can be called the Zero or Original Generation. But these children who went to the elves became the first generation. Among these children were sorcerers who were destined to become legendary figures in the future. Herbert Stemmelford, who in the future would conquer the Tao, the genie of the earth. Agnes of Glanville, the first female sorcerer of the continent. Aurora Henson, Radmir of Tarkar Ned, and many other equally legendary names. All of which will not be listed here, including those never preserved in history. But even the most legendary ones are several dozen. It was a key moment, an exciting moment because something new was born on the continent. The first generation of true sorcerers was born, not physically, but ideologically though, and without pressure from the kings, who were busy with their own affairs, they created their own history. Thus, Jan Batista, Geoffrey Monk, and Jan Becker continued to develop the magical structure whose roots they had planted. They decreed that magic had to be controlled, that there were magical practices that were dangerous for everyone, such as demonology or necromancy. To do that, it was necessary to create an organization, establish control and responsibility. It was necessary to create rules. These three magicians agreed that only this development of the magical art made sense. However, there were those who liked absolute freedom much more. Thus, Jan Batista, Monk and Becker founded the Brotherhood of Sorcerers and began to work on its expansion, creating rules and foundations for the existence of magicians. They were also joined by other magicians of the continent, but there were those who were skeptical of the Brotherhood's idea, like Raffard the White. Raffard the White As we said in the previous video, Raffard the White was the tutor of young Abdank. Abdank was the prince who was to become the king of Temeria, and until he came of age, Abdank's uncle, Abrad the Old Oak, remained the ruler. Raffard was probably the most adored man in Temeria. The common humans loved him incredibly. Raffard's ambitions were appropriate. He remained Prince Abdank's tutor, but he wanted to rule the kingdom. Because of the Novigradian Union, he could not do that directly, so he simply waited until Abdank grew up and could rule Temeria, and until then he imposed his will on Abdank, so that the boy simply listened to his mentor in everything and consulted him. The formation of the Brotherhood of Sorcerers would have meant the end of Raffard the White's ambitions, and therefore he categorically opposed the creation of such an organization. There were others who agreed with Raffard, but their names have not been preserved in history, but the story of Raffard is still known even after hundreds of years, but first things first. So let's break it down and record everything. We are now at the end of the 8th, early 9th century according to the Elven chronology. Several decades have passed since the landing. The political situation is as follows. Redania is fragmented and not a unified state. Temeria is ruled by Abrad the Old Oak until the true heir to the throne, Abdank, matures. In the south, Sintra is only getting stronger. The situation with magic is as follows. The Novigradian Union is concluded, establishing the rights and obligation of kingdom rulers and sorcerers. The Brotherhood of Sorcerers is created. The first generation of young sorcerers was sent to Loch Muine and asked Hamlet to learn magic. 
elves volunteered to teach magic to humans. In parallel, the Brotherhood of Sorcerers was opposed by Rafar the White, who did not want to be controlled by anyone and does not want a single magical organization with its own laws that apply to absolutely all sorcerers. Rafar the White is increasing his influence in Temeria. He is the mentor of Prince Abdank and plans to turn him into his puppet and acts in this way to become Abdank's advisor when he becomes king and to impose his policy in the state through Abdank without formally violating the Navigrating Union. The humans love Raffard. You can see how history thickens, how the interests of different peoples intertwine, how conflicts arise. You can clearly feel the tension in the air. There is a smell of approaching war in the air. The smell of war. It all began in the same Temeria. The ruler Abrad the Old Oak was restless, for he probably realized that his days were numbered. Young Abdank would soon grow up and ascend the throne. Maybe Abrad the Old Oak wanted to remain in history, or maybe there was another reason. We don't know, but in any case, he began to pursue a very aggressive foreign policy. It was during his reign that the Six Years' War with Sintra began, a war about which very little is known, but it is still important. This war was fought between Temeria and Sintra. The war was waged in the border regions for the lands of the Yoruga River, the lands that later became the Principality of Bruges. Since these lands had previously belonged to Sintra, we can assume that it was Temeria that attacked Sintra, considering Bruges its territory and wanting to expand its living space. As you can see on the map, Temeria was rather a small state at that time. The war lasted for six years, as the name implies, and in 836 ended in a virtual deadlock. The sorcerer Raffar the White stopped the bloodshed, managed to reach an agreement with the rulers of both states, and the Treaty of Bruges was signed in Bruges, according to which the parties withdrew their claims against each other. It is known that the Six Years' War turned out worst not for Temeria or Sintra, but exclusively for their allies. For example, under the terms of the Treaty of Bruges, the Duke of Atre suffered greatly, he rebelled against Sintra on the side of Temeria, and the peace treaty recognized Atre as Sintra's land. So the prince named Wenger was exiled from Sintra, along with hundreds of his supporters, his entire court, that is. These people were forced to leave their native land. They set out on a journey into the unknown, to the east, right into the lands of the elves. But as we know, the elven state consisted of cities. Elves did not live in villages. That is, the territory between cities was in fact simply empty and belonged to the elves only nominally. No one wanted to protect it. Wenger took advantage of this and founded the settlement of Wengerberg at the headwaters of the Ponte River, a settlement that would later become the capital of the state of Edirne. So, as you can see, the expansion of humans continued. For example, in the lands of future Redania, which, as we remember, were fragmented among the countless descendants of King Sambok, two rather strong formations emerged. In Novigrad, the ruler Radovid of Novigrad. No, this is not the legendary King Radovid the Great, but his ancestor instead rose to prominence. His cousin, Milan Ropenek, was under the command of his guard. Radovid of Novigrad controlled Novigrad itself and some land in the vicinity of Ponter. He called these territories Redania. Apparently, this small state formation was a proto-Redania, the land from which the great Redanian state would later be born. Radovid of Redania, of course, wanted to expand his possessions. We have already mentioned several states that wanted to expand but could not fight other countries of humans. It is clear that very quickly the gaze of all these hawks turned to the east, to the unprotected and scattered cities of the elves. Yep, just cities. These were neither strongholds nor fortresses. The elves believed they had nothing to fear. They were confident and carefree. They had not yet encountered human savagery, human xenophobia, human cruelty. They did not know that a certain distant General Ropenek sincerely hated elves for the very fact of their existence and was ready to slaughter entire cities, burn children and quarter elven magicians. They did not know that the Temerian ruler, after a grueling war, would decide to take revenge on them and would be ready for the same blood and cruelty. They did not know that the young settlement of Engerberg would soon play a bloody practical joke on them. They had hoped that by teaching human children, young sorcerers, they would gain the loyalty of the peoples of humans. But they were wrong. General Ropenek did not care about the affairs of the sorcerers. The Novigradian Union helped him with that. 
politicians did not interfere in the affairs of sorcerers and vice versa, and as a result, the elves paid dearly for their short-sightedness. The Great War was coming. The elves gave no reason for humans to attack. But did the humans ever need reasons to kill and commit atrocities? A short time before this madness, the elven seers did sound the alarm. They saw death coming. They saw in their dreams the armies preparing to attack them in Temeria and Redania. The elves immediately sent the young human sorcerers who had studied in Loch Muine and Est Hamlet back to Joffrey Monk and his brotherhood. They did get taught to control and master the power, though. However, the elves refused to accept any more children for studies, because their good intentions and their help turned against them. The elves began to arm themselves, but it was too late. The war was about to begin. Very soon, the palaces and grand houses of the elven cities would burn. Very soon, the elves will reap things they have sown themselves. However, this is a story for the next video. In the meantime, we thank everyone who watched this particular video, so please like, comment, subscribe, and we promise that the history of the witch's universe will be released more often. We'd also appreciate if you decided to join our brotherhood of patrons or founded a new one of the YouTube sponsors right here. This would give us some powerful fuel to the fire of quality content creation. Anyway, thank you all for watching once again and see you soon when the Old Witcher speaks once more.